Okay, in this video, I'm going to introduce um, the imaginary number i, and we're going to define it and talk about how we use it in representing solutions to quadratic equations. Um, in future videos, we will talk about um, i in relation to complex numbers and how to actually perform operations with them. Um, but for today, talking about um, the value i and where it shows up in our quadratic solutions, um, let's kind of take one step back and recall what we drew at the very beginning of this year, um, or at some point, hopefully, in your mathematical career, you've seen what we call the number system. The number system is just the development of numbers. So <clears throat> you think about way back in the day, we talked about kind of in class day one about mathematicians didn't just appear, right? At some point, there was a caveman. I don't know, right? Here he is. I'm really good at art. Um, there's his beard. And he had to figure out a way to count his sheep, right? And then eventually civilization develops a little bit further and they start to barter and then they start to use money. And so there's positives and negatives. And this development comes from a need. And it started, right, just with natural numbers. So we use that weird symbol N and natural numbers are just like the numbers 1, 2, 3. Um, then eventually they created a placeholder. So the number 0 that allowed them to repeat digits and not have to memorize so many symbols in their civilizations. Um, we then have negative numbers that came along. And again, negative numbers, you'll remember probably when you first learned negative numbers, they can be a little challenging at first. Um, <clears throat> but you need negative numbers if you're going to solve an equation such as um, 4 plus x is equal to 2. Now that's an impossible equation unless you allow negative numbers to play. Um, because if we subtract 4 here, right, the only thing that's going to work here is if x was equal to negative 2. So negative numbers became necessary in relation to solving equations. Um, and then fractions, right, we use fractions when we use division. Um, and those were called rational numbers, and the q is their symbol. So anytime we had a rational number or a fractional value, um, it could fit in the number system there. And then they run into situations, right, with irrational numbers. And so we use this p to represent irrational numbers, and those are numbers that used radicals, so like the square root of 3. And <clears throat> they found that when they were solving equations, um, let's look at um, an equation such as, we're going to look at a couple of them, but we've got, let's say, 4x squared plus 1 equals 17, right? These solving techniques that we use, we isolate the variable, we get 4x squared is equal to 16. We go ahead and divide by the 4, again, just reversing operations until we've isolated the x. And to reverse a squared, right, then we square root to get rid of that, introduces a positive or negative, because positive... 2 would give you 4 as well as negative 2. So there's two solutions there. We can't just write 2, but we also could write negative 2, right? Both of those values, if you were to square it, would give you that positive 4 that x squared was equal to. So for shorthand, they just came up with plus or minus 2. So all of these little symbols, right, that mathematicians use um, just help them to communicate the language of mathematics. And then, again, um, it came to a point where I'll, probably geometrically first they may have used radicals. But again, when we look at something like this and we add the 18 over, we divide by 3, we divide by 3, um, x squared is equal to 6. Well, 6, there is um, no rational value that when squared is equal to the value of 6. So instead, <clears throat> they came up with a symbol that represented, right, the... Um, square root of 6 and they just left it in that radical symbol so at plus or minus the square root of 6 if we square the square root of 6 then we end up with 6 and that would be our solution so <clears throat> this um, once they accepted that radical symbol right they accepted that that is a that is a value on the number line at some point um, it's just a decimal value and we want to leave it in exact form this is what we call the real number system. All of these numbers can be plotted somewhere on the real number line, right? With zero lying at the center, positive numbers are graphed to the right, negative numbers are graphed to the left, and all of those values could be on there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> eventually, however, um, equations such as the following, I'm going to write another one off to the right, x squared, say, plus 19 is equal to 3. Now we start to solve these equations, and we subtract the 19 over, and we get x squared is equal to negative 16. 
So we say, okay, well, what number squared is going to give me a negative 16? Now, the first thoughts when we talk about this sometimes in class is students will say, well, 4 times negative 4, right? But it has to be two of the exact same value. And if you square 4 or negative 4, it gives you a positive value. So there really is nothing that you can square because squaring it multiplies it by itself and you can't square a negative and get a negative um, that works for this. So for years, right, mathematicians and if you were a little math student back in the day, you would say there's no real solution. This one doesn't have a real number solution. There is no value on this number line um, over here that <coughs> could be represented. Um, however, um, it continues to show up in a lot of the solving and in all these equations. So they create instead a symbol to represent it. Again, mathematics is just a growing body, right? And as they find applications, they continue to accept these, what they first thought were absurd values. Um, again, we use that plus or minus symbol. And instead of leaving the negative inside, um, we want to be able to simplify it and represent it. So what we use is we use this little i symbol. And i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So if you think about the square root of 16, I could split that up as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 16. That's the same thing. And we know that the square root of 16 is 4. So I know that my answer here could be plus or minus 4. And then I guess I could write times the square root of negative 1. And I could just write that by all of my answers all of the time, anytime there was a negative involved. But instead, mathematicians said, well, let's create a symbol for this because it shows up so often. And so they use a little cursive i. So instead of writing the square root of negative 1, we write x equals plus or minus 4, and we write i. And this is what our solution would look like. Now, <coughs> um, again, that i shows up when we see it inside of a radical. So in our number system, that's where we drew this new numbers out here, and we called them imaginary numbers. And we said when you use imaginary numbers and real numbers together, that creates like one more um, number system here or set. And we called those complex numbers. So we'll talk about those in the next video when I take a real number and I add or subtract it with some sort of imaginary number. Okay, and again, this is the square root of a negative value. Now, <clears throat> one thing I do want to point out really quickly um, is I want us to consider if you have um, the square root of a negative number. So again, let's just use negative 16 since we just used it. Um, that's different than if I have the cube root of a negative number, and I want us to consider why. Now, the square root of a negative, we kind of already talked about it. There is no number that I could multiply by itself, because negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16. Um, 4 times 4 is positive 16, and I can't have a negative factor and a positive factor as a square root, so it just doesn't work. So in this case, when we break this down, we use 4i to represent that negative portion that can't be simplified. With a cube root, so notice this guy, if it's an odd index, um, we don't need an i value. Because um, when you have an odd number of factors, you can multiply an odd number of factors and still get a negative. Um, notice negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. When you multiply the first two factors, you do get that positive value, but then you multiply it by the third factor, and you do end up getting a negative value. So <clears throat> negative 2 would actually be the cube root of um, negative 8. So just so you're aware, right, we're dealing with quadratics, and so we're dealing with square roots, so our solutions will have an i in the answer um, in the future when we see cube roots. Um, we'll recognize that negatives can be a solution um, because of the odd index there, okay? So let's just practice a couple of these, and I'm going to talk more about the relationship to the graph in the next video with discriminants. So let's use <clears throat> a few of these um, solving techniques we've been practicing in the past. And again, I'm <clears throat> just going to define this here. So this little cursive i that we use is equal to the square root of negative 1. So anytime we see a negative where our index is even or a square root, right, if this is an even index, um, we're going to have a negative 1 show up. So...
Um, let's try solving an equation here and just see what that's going to look like. Again, the solving techniques are the same that we've been practicing, so I just want us to recognize that. So if I'm solving this equation right here, um, I have x squared minus 16x plus 2 equals 0. Uh, everything is equal to 0. That's great. I can look to see if it's factorable. Nothing multiplies to 2 that adds to 16, so I'm going to go ahead and complete the square, right? There's an even number in the middle there, so I would have x squared minus 16x. I'm going to leave room to complete the square, move the 2 out of the way, and that's equal to 0. Remember, when we complete the square, we take half the middle term and square it to find that perfect number to add in. In this case, 8 squared, or negative 8 squared, is 64, and if I add 64, I need to keep it balanced. So I subtract 64. So in this case, I get x squared um, minus, oh, okay, just kidding. We're going to factor this. And I feel like I created a problem that does not have a complex number, but let's finish her out. When we complete the, or uh, combine those two, we get negative 62 is equal to 0. So in this case, we have x minus 8 squared. Um, I'm going to move the 62 to the other side. Oh, it's a positive 62. So tricks on me. Um, x minus 8 equals plus or minus the square root of 62. Now notice here, um, I could try and break this down, but that's 2 and 31. doesn't break down. There is no negative inside, so I don't need an i on this one. Um, I'm just going to add the 8 over, so x is equal to 8 plus or minus the square root of 62. No i needed if there's no negative in the radical. Okay, let's try another one. Um, hopefully we'll get one here. All right, 3x squared plus 10x plus 12 equals 0. Again, it's equal to 0. We look for a greatest common factor. Nothing divides out of all of those, so we continue to solve. Um, this one has a 3 in front, so I'm going to use the quadratic formula. So remember the quadratic formulas, negative b plus or minus the square root of that b value, squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. So a is 3, looks like b is 10, and c is 12. So x is going to be equal to opposite b, or in other words, negative 10, plus or minus the square root of b squared. So 10 squared minus 4 times a, which is 3. C, which is 12, all over 2 times the A value, which is 3. Remember, in simplifying with the quadratic formula, um, we multiply uh, what's in the radical first to simplify that. So if we multiply um, this guy right here, um, I better multiply that on the calculator to make sure I get it correctly. Correct. Um, and it looks like I come out with negative 44. So we get negative 44 there. Um, <clears throat> and notice that negative inside the radical. So this is going to come out and be like an I right here. So anytime we see that negative sneak up inside the radical, so this would be 4 times 11. 4 is 2 and 2. So that 2 actually gets to come out with the I. So we're going to have negative 10 plus or minus 2i times the square root of 11. And this is all going to be over 6. And then remember, we look to see if we can simplify anything here. So it looks like our three coefficients are all divisible by 2. So we're going to write our final answer when we divide that by 2. So negative 5 plus or minus 1i, or just i, square root of 11 all over 3. So the biggest thing today when you're solving, again, you're just practicing solving, solving, solving. You can use any of the methods um, as far as complete the square or quadratic formula. The equation will not be factorable in the way that we've practiced um, on your homework today if there is an I involved. So just remember, if it's not negative, we solve like normal. Um, if there is a negative inside the radical, um, then we're going to go ahead and pull that um, negative out and represent it with an I when we simplify and write our final answer. Okay, in the next video we'll discuss the discriminant and what that is and how